Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick Save. I'm an energy policy analyst and lecturer in the EIPER environmental program uh, at Stanford, and wanted to talk to you today a little bit about uh, some of the environmental neuroeconomics work uh, that came out of uh, my PhD, uh, working with Brian Knudsen's Fan Lab uh, and Tara Srirangarajan and Tierney Teeth uh, at National Geographic. And so we really um, been talking a lot today about uh, a couple of different studies looking into uh, the neural basis of conservation philosophy. So I uh, first started thinking about applying uh, neuroeconomics to the environment back in uh, 2009 uh, when I was reading a lot of neuroeconomics papers for fun and noticed that they were all about you know, how we allocate scarce resources, how we make trade-offs between short-term benefits and long-term gains or between moral and economic values. Um, all things very uh, much applicable to uh, a lot of the environmental questions. Uh, that we wrestle with today. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of the daily environmental decisions uh, that we make are very much wrapped up in financial decision making, um, where we put our money, how we're voting uh, with our dollar for uh, more sustainable products or uh, you know, conserving resources, that sort of thing. Um, now, why would we use neural imaging to, to look into uh, environmental decisions. Well, it really gives us a window into the mind and we can get under the hood and look at uh, the emotional and cognitive mechanisms that um, underlie uh, effective messaging, effective behavioral intervention uh, to get people to act uh, more sustainably. Um, we also have the advantage of being able to uh, understand heterogeneity uh, and individual differences in decision making. Um, this is a big issue when it comes to environmental decisions. Um, people have a wide array of environmental behaviors uh, that they engage in, even if they all think of themselves as, as uh, pro-environmental, that might manifest very differently uh, for different people. And that may be uh, a combination of factors uh, from their, their own environment, their own circumstances, uh, to uh, how they process things and what their values are. Um, we can also excitingly, uh, you know, predict national behavior. So um, the Knutson Lab has really been uh, spearheading this uh, called neuro forecasting, uh, taking you know just 20 to 40 people's uh, brain activity and then being able to uh, forecast what happens at a uh, national or even global scale uh, with market data. And uh, both Span Lab and, and others. Uh, have been able to show this in everything from uh, you know which Kickstarter and Kiva campaigns get funded uh, to you know movie sit sales, the efficacy of anti smoking ad campaigns, all of that kind of stuff. So really letting us look at the individual, but then also um, take apart that decision process and uh, hopefully uh, be able to forecast it in a way that scales for people. And the, the real promise there is um, hoping that we have the potential to optimize interventions that facilitate uh, pro-environmental Uh Both at Stanford and at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, I've worked on a, a variety of different applications of this. Um, the ones that we're going to be really focusing on today, however, are the last three. So aspects of environmental philanthropy, conservation messaging and, and environmental uh, action. And this really came out of um, initially wanting us to uh, try and use brain imaging to predict the success of environmental messaging and environmental messaging campaigns. Um, we weren't able to get a um, consistent enough spread of uh, data on how uh, campaigns performed from nonprofits. Um, and so we, we started talking, got a grant from National Geographic, uh, and started talking with them about um, what might be possible. And, you know, being National Geographic, they, of course, are very concerned about their photography. Uh, and the question came up of, you know, how does nature imagery really facilitate engagement uh, and, and conservation, right? Like, what are the 
elements of photography that are predicting engagement at a global scale, how do our brains respond, and, and what can translate that into uh, actual uh, donation. So um, they give us uh, three months worth of photos from their Instagram feed, uh, almost 900 photos, along with real world indicators of, of engagement. So what was the liking and commenting behavior like on each of these? Um, and then we deconstruct the image content and, and tabbed everything. So uh, we triangulated in a variety of methods. Uh, we had a number of different dimensions where we um, coded objective image content. Uh, then a computer algorithm from Mark Berman's lab at U of Chicago was able to quantify um, a lot of the low level visual features, uh, edge density, entropy, uh, saturation, hue, all of that stuff. Uh, and and give us um, you know assigned numbers for all of that, and then uh, we also did a nationally representative survey uh, that crowdsourced subjective rating uh, that gave us uh, indicators of um, how people were feeling, the emotions that were elicited um, when they were looking at all of these uh, photos, um, and then also their hypothetical donation behavior. And then we had an incentive compatible fMRI study. That's really what we're going to be talking about today um, of a subset of those uh, of those photos uh, and being able to take apart neural responses, real world donation, uh, and actual liking, uh, as well as some subjective rating from, from a smaller set of individuals. And we really wanted to focus uh, in this uh, study on uh, species and trying to donate to species conservation. Uh, we're going to, there's a lot of different uh, areas of the brain that we could break down. We wanted to talk about things like, you know, social cognition, number processing, uh, all of that. We're really gonna be focusing today um, on affect, which is what uh, the Knudsen lab uses uh, and has been, it seemed to be most powerful for uh, neural forecasting uh, across a, a number of studies. Um, and, Frank Knudsen built this uh, AIM framework uh, that stands for affect leading it into integration of information, uh, which then drives motivation of behavior. And uh, there's really three areas that can kind of keep it simple and focus on today. Um, one being the nucleus accumbens, or more broadly, the ventral striatum, um, handling positive arousal, um, being the reward pathway. Uh, very responsive to, to gains and positive stimuli. Anterior insula for negative arousal, um, reacting to losses. Uh, and then medial prefrontal cortex for um, integrating value, integrating emotional processing, but also doing um, cost benefit assessment and, uh, and trying to figure out what things are worth. Now, back in 2015, we did do this uh, in a slightly different context where uh, we studied environmental philosophy for. Um, protecting uh, state and national park land uh, where there were um, different destructive proposed land uses. Um, and, you know, for example, uh, there's been pressure for, for a while for, you know, mining within 10 miles of Yosemite Park, which would affect the water there, um, that sort of thing. And we tried to use wherever possible, um, you know, real, real world uh, land uses. Uh, and at the time, uh, there was a, a severe budget crisis in the California state parks where they were thinking about uh, potentially shuttering uh, a quarter of them. Uh, and so that really motivated us to, to delve into this. And um, what we found was that um, negative affect towards destructive proposed land uses, the more destructive people found it, the more um, it drove their anterior insula activity. Uh, and then this anterior insula activity uh, motivated real environmental donations, uh, and it was visibly stronger in those with uh, pro-environmental uh, attitudes. If they had strong pro-environmental attitudes, um, not only were they you know, more likely to donate, but that uh, that sense of outreach uh, and, and negative affect was, was amplified. Interestingly, um, MPFC activity, which often indexes what something is worth to you uh, and can be a positive driver uh, of choices in, in many other contexts was actually associated with withholding donations, keeping the money 
uh, for yourself. We also found uh, something similar uh, a few years later when we did a study on um, eco-labeling and energy efficiency purchases, uh, where again, um, the emotional aspects were motivating uh, behavior. In that case, um, nucleus accumbens and caudate uh, responding positively to uh, energy efficiency and eco-labeling. Uh, and uh, then the anterior insula uh, negatively for, for high cost and efficient uh, products. And uh, the MPFC, again, uh, pushing people to conserve their money uh, and, and not buy. So uh, with this fMRI study, patients saw 56 different photographs from that original set uh, of 890 images. Um, we took a spread from each quartile of engagement and tried to be consistent about uh, the popularity, um, being representative of uh, that distribution all the way down, as well as as much as we could with such a small set, um, trying to match the distribution for content variables. So things like presence of water, predators, that sort of thing. And participants were endowed with uh, $30 to use or not during the task. Uh, one donation decision and one liking decision were randomly chosen to count as binding at the end of the experiment. And uh, donation requests vary between $2 to $28. Um, and uh, the, then went to groups that conserve the displayed species and the dwarf habitat. Um, and then people did a questionnaire where they gave us subjective rating as well. And we got demographics, environmental attitudes, charitable giving history, and so forth. Uh, we had 51 people scanned, uh, had a lot of head motion in this cohort, unfortunately. Uh, so 37 people were, were useful for analyzing their liking choice, 33 for uh, their donation choice. Um, and uh, they had a, a spread, pretty average of pro-environmental attitude. All of them needed a pre-existing Instagram account, and therefore they were a little bit on the younger side. And so they would see the image for four seconds. Then we'd ask them whether they'd be open to liking it on Instagram, yes or no, donating, uh, yes or no. And they went through a number of, of uh, those trials. So what we're going to be looking at is decision to like within the group, then um, seeing if we can predict engagement performance at a global level, and then the decision to donate. So. Uh, Four uh, decisions um, on liking, really driven uh, during the liking phase and at the beginning of the uh, photograph being shown, you can see a lot of activity in the nucleus accumbens. Um, the anterior insula later on uh, is responding uh, negatively. Right? Um, they, they tended not to, to like it in that case. Um, caudate, another part of the ventral striatum, acting similarly, but perhaps not as strongly as the uh, nucleus accumbens. And then the MPFC being very distinguished uh, during the liking decision and the donation decision um, for, for photos that they liked. Um, and so you can see during the photo phase at that onset, uh, we have uh, central striatal activity. And during the liking choice phase, we have uh, the MPFC activity. Um, and here's the, uh, the different regions, regions at that phase. We also did a PPI analysis, thanks to Dr. Kelly McNiven, and um, essentially found that on trials where uh, people were liking, uh, the NAC and the MPFC had, had strong um, functional connectivity, but not for things that they uh, were not interested in liking. Um, and logistic regressions, we found um, you know, NAC and MPFC uh, promoting liking, enter insulin not, uh, and then when we factored that in uh, with the combined ratings, uh, the one that, that stood out the strongest uh, was nucleus accumbens. The other, others um, you know, had some collinearity with um, both the subjective ratings people provided and, and of course, PA and NA uh, being plus arousal and negative arousal. Um, you know, they're, they're going to be proxies for that. Um, now, what about in global engagement? Um, we can see a little bit uh, more distinction here on the NAC. It's not, not nearly as strong as when you're looking within group, um, but the anterior insula is pretty consistent at showing um, below median engagement on, on photos. Uh, in the light, 
latter part of the, the liking choice phase. Um, the MPFC uh, is still uh, showing pretty robustly um, you know, stronger activity if something is, is a more popular um, photo on Instagram. And so we, we do see pretty strong MPFC signal there. Uh, and you can see here, you know, nucleus cumin is not really doing uh, all that much. The error bars are uh, completely overlapping um, for, you know, all the different core files of uh, popularity. Uh, and anterior insula, what we see is it's being deactivated for the popular stuff uh, in the upper half. Um, and then the MPFC looks pretty nicely, uh, you know, a, a linear uh, progression of popularity um, of those images. Um, and what we see here, NAC not being significant, but anterior insula negatively predicting and MPFC positively predicting uh, global engagement. Now, how do environmental attitudes influence the processing of popular nature imagery? Um, we need to delve into this a little bit more, but what it looks like, there's anterior insula uh, differences uh, in activation um, and also MPFC differences. And what it seems like is really people that have high pro-environmental attitudes, uh, when things are in that top half of uh, popularity, uh, they've got very strong deactivation. Um, people that don't care as much about the environment, interestingly, actually have elevated anterior insula for the really popular stuff. And what we think this might be response to actually uh, is that they're doing the liking right before the uh, donation phase and very probably they are, um, you know, uh, worried about the fact that they might actually be having to donate. Uh, and we get a similar pop on their MPFC, um, really driving driving that MPFC for, for donation decision. Um, the, the high NEP people, high pro environmental people, uh, can be a little bit more linear on MPFC, but um, you know, not as not quite as linear. So what motivates donation? So we, we see robust uh, NAC activity there, both the liking and donation phase, uh, on trials where they did donate, um, and uh, also in the caudate. And then the MPFC, especially activity during the liking phase, when they're evaluating it then, um, is, is really setting up uh, what they're going to do by donation. And by the time that we ask the donation question, they see what the dollar amount is. Um, it's, it's distinguished and then it kind of uh, starts overlapping. It's not a major distinction that's bottom of their mind. Um, but yeah, we see a lot of um, a lot of ventral spherical activity uh, during the decision to donate uh, and quite robust uh, in, in the NAC. Uh, and here, yeah, the NAC basically is, is the, the one really uh, deciding that donation. So to summarize, um, you know, all of those different areas that we've been talking about today within the AIM framework uh, are associated with decisions uh, to like nature imagery uh, on social media. Anterior and insula and MPFC are really scaling uh, to predict uh, the aggregate um, and predict global engagement uh, on Instagram. And uh, the nucleus cumbens is, is really driving the decision to donate. Um, Next steps, we're going to be delving a lot more into the National Representative Survey, which gives us a lot of different ways to break down what's in all the images in the larger almost 900 image sample um, and, and take apart what aspects are really driving popularity and engagement. And at least we'll have hypothetical data on um, how that translates into uh, willingness to donate. We also want to get a little more under the hood with the brain data and see how that, um, how activity in the visual areas and parts of the, the visual content that Mark Berman's lab deconstructed in the images maybe relate back to uh, the donation and liking decision uh, as well. So getting into those, uh, digging into that a little bit, seeing how it connects to the, the brain activity. Um, so I just wanted to thank um, my collaborator, Tierney Teef at uh, National Geographic, and National Geographic for providing funding, uh, as well as the EIPER program. And then everybody at SPAN Lab, so Brian Knudsen, uh, since I've moved on to um, energy policy uh, analyst role, um, Tara Srirangarajan has really uh, spearheaded taking the data, running with it, and, and getting us uh, deeper in. Kelly McNiven uh, 
helping out on the PPI analyses, and then Mark Berman's uh, lab for, for deconstructing uh, data. And we had many undergraduate researchers uh, helping out as well. So I'm happy to uh, you know answer any questions. Feel free to reach out to me uh, on email uh, if you're interested in this work. And uh, thanks for your time.